The guy reached out and he wrapped me and he said, okay, Lanson, stand up. And at that moment, I had to make a choice whether I was going out on that step or I was going to stay in that nice warm cockpit. Now I hope before we get done in the next three days I can teach you some of the things I learned about the Christian life. I kidded Mrs. Adams, but she means an awful lot to me. Her mother was instrumental in my finding the Lord as a high school senior. And it was through our dean's consistent life and witness that God spoke to me. But I have to tell you something. The first 10 years of my Christian life, I thought it was a pretty lousy deal that I'd gotten into. And man, I was preaching eight and a half of those 10 years. I'm going to tell you about that in the next couple of days as we share together. I've been converted now 26 years this coming September. Let me tell you some of the things I found out real quick. Number one, I found out that Christianity is not a church and it's not a creed. And it is not a doctrine and it is not a denomination. It is not a rule book. It is not a system of legalism. Christianity is one thing, pure and simple. It is a personal relationship with Almighty God provided by His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And when you finally discover that, a whole lot of things begin to make sense that never made sense before. You know, one of the things that used to just drive me nuts was this thing that if somehow I got dedicated enough, I would know the will of God. <laughs> That is a bag of bones. I don't buy that tripe anymore. Man, I would get so dedicated, I'd confess everything I knew. I'd make up things to confess so I could get more dedicated. I'd have devotions, I'd read, I'd pray. Man, I'd get my heart right and I'd pray about a thing. God still didn't give me any answer. Then I discovered something. I discovered something that all through my life I had to make choices. If I was going to jump, I had to get up and I had to get on the step. And the Christian life, my young friend, is a relationship with God through a span of time where you and I must make choices. And nothing gives me a pain quicker than the person who gets somehow in their feather head that all of their problems are somebody else's doing. Yeah, I'm a mess, but I'm a mess because my mom and dad are a mess. Man, you just don't know my mom and dad. Or I'm a mess because I got to go to a Christian school and I think the thing stinks. Or I'm a mess because my old lady and my old man make me go to church all the time and it's a pit. <laughs> or I'm a mess because Jimmy Carter doesn't know what he's doing. I tell you, I'm going to even quit buying peanuts. <laughs> I 
I'm for the best man. I wish there was one. You know, the trouble with our country and the trouble with our churches and the trouble with most of our Christians is they all are asking this question. What are you going to do about my problem? I'm not doing nothing about your problem. What are you going to do about it? You can jump out of the airplane, but not unless you stand up and get on the step, you turkey. There are some things you got to make up your mind about. Let me tell you, I don't envy you, man. I'm glad I'm about done living. I'm 43 going on 83. I'm too pooped to pop. I got pains that pills won't even reach. I'm not as bad as Mrs. Adams, at least my hair is still the right color. <laughs> I bet you she's later for chapel the next two days. She'll show up for the benediction, huh? But, man. You got to handle your life. I got it clear up to here with these Christians who use God for some kind of a cop out. Well, I got all this stuff wrong in my life, and man, I pray about it, and I ask God to take it away, and He doesn't take it away. I guess it must be all right. What kind of stupid reasoning is that? I used to work at this place until they got the victory over me. And you know, when I left here, I started a nonprofit corporation, three corporate profit corporations, and three partnerships, and all of a sudden I was in a mess. I didn't know whether to whistle or wind my watch, you know? So I went and I, and I hired a management counselor. It was an interesting experience. I was talking to him one day. He said, you're not too happy today. I said, no, I'm not. Well, he said, can you tell me why you're unhappy? I said, sure I can. And I named about three things plus my kids. Then he gave me a profound piece of advice. He looked at me for a long minute, and I looked at him, and he said, Well, why don't you quit doing the things that make you unhappy then and start doing the things that make you happy? Stand up. You have to make some choices. Well, I got out on that step. Are you ready, honey? You be my post again, won't you? I got out on that step, and there I am. And the guy said, now when you get out there, remember, don't look down. Look up. I said, why don't I look down? He said, you won't like it. And he said, you may get into trouble. I said, what kind of trouble? He said, three weeks ago, we had a guy who got out there. He looked down. He got so scared when it was time to push off. Instead of pushing off, he reached out and grabbed the wing strut with both hands and froze there and hung. <laughs> he said, we tried to tip the plane up so he could fall back in. He said, then I got in the door and I tried to help him a little bit, but I couldn't reach him. So he said, finally, we just shook the plane till he got tired and fell off. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's pretty good advice.
I don't need this, but you got such a sweet shoulder. <laughs> so I'm out here and I think, if I want to stay out of trouble, look up. Now, I want to guarantee you something. Sooner or later, you are going to get in trouble. I guarantee you, sooner or later, trouble's going to come knock at your door. You open it up, hello, I'm trouble. <laughs> you know, maybe it's happened already to some of you. I work down in the south end of Seattle. And down there we got a lot of single parent families. A young lady came in my office the other day, 17 years of age, sat down and we visited and I said, you look upset. And she broke down and she began to sob and shake and she said, oh, pastor, am I ever going to know what it's like to live in a real home. I had a little 12 year old boy come to me. And he sat down and he talked about everything. And I said, Son, why did you come to see me? I'll never forget what he did. He went like this. I can't tell, I can't tell, I can't tell, I can't tell. He just started to sob. And I talked to him and I pressed him and I pressed him because I knew he needed to tell. Finally he said, could you give me a piece of paper and a pencil and I'll write it down. He wrote it on the paper and he handed it back to me and I opened it up. And it said, nobody knows it but I've been molesting my six-year-old sister. Trouble. I want to tell you something. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much you love God. I don't care how much tithe you give. I don't care how many days you have your devotions in a row. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how many verses of scripture you read. I don't care how many years you've been to Christian school. I'm going to guarantee you something. Trouble is going to come and knock on your door. Where in the world do we get this gobbledygook that because you put faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're supposed to be able to go through your whole life and never have any trouble? <laughs> Man, you get saved and the grass is greener and the trees are taller and the girls smell prettier and oh, I have this wonderful feeling and it's so... Oh kind of stuff makes me sick. Or that neat testimony, I love Jesus with all my heart and I want to go all the way with him. What a bag of worms. You want to know why trouble comes? Why does God allow trouble to come? You want to know why? Because it's good for you. That's right. 